I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And this is Come Follow Me Insights from Book of Mormon Central. Today, we'll be discussing Mosiah 4 through 6. And as a reminder, we have lots of great resources on our study guide. Go to our website and you'll find lots of supplemental helps. I want to begin by telling you about a lady that I never actually got the opportunity to meet in my mission. We were at a zone conference and the bishop who was there with his wife helping to provide the lunch for us down in uh, Curitiba, Brazil was the name of the mission I was in. He uh, was helping us do the dishes really quickly after lunch and he shared with a few of us uh, elders a story of, of a widow in his ward that had happened uh, fairly recently at that point. This widow lived down in the river bottoms. For those of you who know anything about the river bottoms in a third world country, it's not like the river bottoms in the suburbs or in the nice cities here in, in North America. River bottoms meant that you didn't have to pay for the land because you have places on the side of the river where people could build shacks for free. And the reason why it was free is because during the rainy season, if you got big storms, the water would fill and it would wipe out everything they had. If you lived in the river bottoms, you're not doing well. Well, the missionaries found this, this widow who lived there in a very small shack. She was very responsive to the gospel, joined the church, got baptized, and the bishop said he, he wanted to go visit her to see how she was doing as a new member. And he said when he walked into her shack, his heart just dropped. It's this little thrown together with, with uh, spare wood and tin for a roof um, structure, and inside the only thing she had was a a uh, foam pad that was on the on the dirt for her bed. She had um, a gas propane tank with a screw on top for her stove. She had a bucket for her sink on a stump, and she had two sawhorses and a couple of or a few slats of wood on the top for her table and a stump for her chair. And that's what this woman owned and his heart just dropped and he thought, we're going to help her and we're going to do this one piece of furniture at a time and then we're going to find a way to get her an apartment up out of the river bottoms. So for whatever reason, he, he said he decided to start with the table. So that Sunday, this bishop gets up in sacrament meeting and he says, brothers and sisters, there is a, there is a family in our ward that is in need of a, just a small, simple kitchen table doesn't have to be fancy. If any of you have an extra table lying around your house, come see me after the meeting and I will make sure to get that to this family in need because they don't have one. Following the meeting, he said he was involved in, in meeting with a couple of people and doing some things and then there came this quiet knock at his door. He opens his door and there stands this, this widow, this new convert. And he said his first impression was, oh no, I, I wonder if I've offended her. I wonder if she knows that it's for her. And this widow stood there and she said, uh, Bispo, Bishop, I heard your announcement in sacrament meeting and it broke my heart to picture a family somewhere here who doesn't have a table. She said, I don't have much, but I feel so richly blessed by the Lord with what he has given me and for finding the gospel and for all these new friends that I have. And she said, I have two sawhorses and some slats of wood that can go across it and provide a fine table for this family that doesn't have one. Please come by my, my house sometime and pick that up and deliver that to this family so that they can gather around a table to share their, their meals together. That bishop, he, uh, as he was recounting that story to us elders, he, he had a hard time holding back the tears as he said, I, I took that sister and gave her a, a hug and told her that the table was for her. And she couldn't believe it. She thought, I, I have everything I need 
from the Lord. You, I, I don't need a table. I'm good. Um, I've never met that woman. I, I will never meet that woman in this life. Um, however, she's, she changed my life in a lot of ways. She changed how I look at things, how I look at possessions, how I look at the world and what the world offers us versus what God offers us. So as we jump in today to our, our scripture block, uh, Mosiah 4 through 6, you're going to see this, this nothingness of man and, and of the world and the, the fleeting nature of the things that the world has to offer us compared to the wonders and the beauties of what God showers down upon us. So, when we, when we open up Mosiah chapter 4, it's really important that we keep it in context because it, the, the way the Come Follow Me curriculum is designed is we're splitting uh, chapters up sometimes, and in this case, the whole speech of King Benjamin was intended to be a whole unit, but that's, that's too much to cover in one week, so it, it's split up. So chapter 4, it's important to remember the very ending of chapter 3, those words from the angel, the, those don't end on a really high note as far as telling people how wonderful they are. It actually ends on, on a, a call to, to be reminded of the lake of fire and brimstone whose flames are unquenchable and whose smoke ascendeth up forever and ever. Uh, that's, that's pretty pretty profound language. And so, King Benjamin finishes this part, now we open up chapter 4, and he looks out at this big group of people and he notices that all of them are on the ground and they're, they viewed themselves, verse 2, in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth. Taylor talked about the significance of dust in a previous lesson. And these people have now seen their fallen, carnal, sensual, devilish nature that's a part of them from, from chapter 3, um, and it's causing them to be so concerned they cried with one voice saying, oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be pur purified. These people have felt their heart change. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in chapter uh, 5. So, King Benjamin tells them, if the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you to a sense of your nothingness and your worthless and fallen state, I say unto you, if you have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and of his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience and his long suffering towards the children of men and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world that thereby salvation may come to him who should put his trust in the Lord, be diligent and continue in faith. Did you notice what he just did? He gave the context of here's your worthless and fallen state that you now see more clearly than you ever have before. He lines it up with, now can you see God's goodness, his mercy, his his perfection, his patience, his matchless power, his, he, he's everything that we aren't. And the amazing thing is, as that he's not a typical king or ruler who's off in some far corner of the universe gloating in how good he is and how bad we are. His whole work, his whole glory is to seek after us to see if we can make covenant connections with him so that he can infuse us with more of his perfection. So you'll notice the bottom part of verse 6, the putting our trust in him, not in the arm of the flesh, not in people around us alone. Be diligent in keeping his commandments, not hearkening to the voices of, of people all around us in the world today, and continue in the faith. So you get this beautiful setup, and then one of, in my opinion, one of the most profound uh, exhortations or invitations in the entire canon of Scripture is verse 9 and 10. You can picture this king. He told his people earlier, you can see my frame doth quake before you. We know he's about three years away from, from passing away. 
So he's at the end of his life, he has loved, he has served, he's put everything he can into these people, and now he gives this powerful invitation. Though his frame is weak, I can picture his voice ramping up and being really strong here as he says, verse 9, believe in God, believe that he is and that he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that he has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that man cannot comprehend all the things which the Lord can comprehend. And again, believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourselves before God and ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive you. And now, if you believe all these things, see that ye do them. I love the fact that he uses this word so much in, in such a short sequence here in the speech. We live in a world that is skeptical, that is, that is always looking with a negative eye towards claims of truth that come from above, that are always trying to poke holes in what the prophets say. Um, rather than putting question marks after everything we hear from the, from the prophets, seers, and revelators, we would do good to believe in God, trust that what he's giving us through his, his appointed servants is actually his, his will for us today. There's a great power in the human act of believing, of, of opening one's heart and saying, Lord, I believe even though we have nothing other than his word or a feeling alone to go on, answers will come after the trial of our faith has passed, not before often. And King Benjamin is really hitting that hard. So this is one of the most powerful parts of this speech, although we'll probably be saying that a lot because this covenantal speech from King Benjamin is inviting us to see what we can do to be in covenantal relationship with God. And I love this word, believe, that Tyler has highlighted. And we encourage you as you're reading the scriptures that you circle those places or underline them, somehow mark them, and look carefully at every single thing that King Benjamin has asked us to believe. And I wanna talk about where this word comes from. The B actually means fully or 100%. You find it, the word be in words like beloved, that Jesus is the beloved son, the 100% loved son. This word leave is very interesting. It comes from a word that we all know, but may have never imagined that a word that we all care about and matter, that matters so much to our lives is actually the foundation for the rest of this word believe. The word believe in its original sense, its foundational sense, means to fully love. So let's think again. What is Benjamin asking of us? Verse 9, fully love God. Fully love that he is. Fully love that he has all wisdom and all power both in heaven and earth. Fully love that We don't comprehend God, and let me just talk briefly about that word. Comprehend doesn't mean simply understanding, it actually means to contain. Uh, To use kind of a basic example, uh, I use containers at home for leftovers, and I put things into the container. I comprehend my leftovers. And God cannot be contained. We cannot contain him. We could not put him into a box. Can we understand God? Yes. Can we know him? Yes. We can be in intimate relationship with him, but we cannot contain him. That's what literally what comprehend means. And so we have to fully love the fact that we're not greater than God. We'd have to be greater than God to comprehend or to contain him. And it's actually his arms that are comprehending us, containing us in his love. And that's what believe is about. And so when you think about what to believe, It's what you fully love. And God has made it very clear through his prophets like King Benjamin, what we should be loving. The world will tell you many things that you should love, but ultimately what will give us the greatest joy 
is loving what the prophets have revealed to us that we should love. And let's again review verse 10. Again, fully love that you must repent. That's an interesting one. I know in my personal life, when I have a moment that I need to repent, actually not a moment, but actually an ongoing need, uh, I don't automatically feel like I'm in love with that process of repentance because there's a bit of fear that I have to change and there's going to be a little bit of the purging fire or maybe a lot that I need to experience. But we can love that. And when we do this, we are humble and we actually then get that forgiveness that we all seek. And then he says, if you believe all these things, see that you do them. Meaning, if you fully love all this truth that I've offered, you would do it. So I want you to think about, as you look at the word believe in King Benjamin's speech and elsewhere in scripture, what is it teaching us about what we should be loving? Benjamin then uh, transitions into this little section about parenting because here he has families and he's got people all the way through the age spectrum in each of these families in front of him on the ground and he now counsels parents. So it's, it's beautiful for parents and grandparents and teachers to look at the specific things in verse 14, 15, and 16 of chapter 4 that he shares with them in this inspiring moment. It's pretty profound uh, as far as how we teach our children and teach the young, the rising generations. Verse 19, for behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being, even God, for all the substance which we have? Brothers and sisters, whenever the scriptures use words like all or none or always or never or any, it's it's usually intentional, I would think. Um, it's a pretty powerful opportunity to mark those. You'll notice what percentage of us are beggars. That's all. That's 100%. Do we not all depend upon that same being, even God, for all of our substance which we have for both food and raiment and for gold and for silver and for all riches which we have of every kind? I have a question for you. When's the last time that you were able to go into some task, some responsibility, some something that you were you were doing, and you could actually pause and think about it for a minute and say, looking upward, "Hey, uh, I, I got this one. I, I'm good. I I don't need any help from you on this one. I'll I'll check in when you, with you when I'm done. But I, I got this one under control." chances are you've never done that. And if you've done that, you've, <laughs> you've added to your most ex embarrassing experiences list because the fact is there is nothing that little old Tyler Griffin ever does or that Taylor Halverson or that any of you ever do that is completely in isolation from God's power, his mercy, his goodness, his grace, his merits. King Benjamin really, really hits this hard, this idea of don't look at people who have less than you and think it's, it's all their fault. There may be some situations, some decisions, some choices they've made that have brought certain things upon them. I get that, but that's not our judgment. That's not our call. So now as we come to the – near the end or the close of chapter 4, this is an important thing for, for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who have, who have a big, big expectation of things that are, that are required to be a, a, a disciple of Christ. If you struggle with a voice in your head that's telling you you're never doing enough, you're never going to be enough, what you did wasn't what needed to be done, you should have done something else, or, or anything along that line that, that makes you feel less uh, capable, less powerful as a son or a daughter of beloved heavenly parents in trying to, to serve other people and do the things that are required, you should mark verse 27. And then you should mark it again because after all it's remarkable, see? Look at verse 27. See that all 
there's that 100% thing. All these things are done in wisdom and order. For it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent that thereby he might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. Brothers and sisters, if we can do better collectively as well as individually at going to the Lord with our long list of things to do, this is a principle my wife, Kiplin, has taught me recently and it's powerful. If we can put our to-do list on the altar of the Lord and say, here's what I think I need to do today, help me know what thou would have me do, then that to-do list, when it's offered to the Lord, can be shaped and molded and readjusted and adapted and edited to become his will-do list, which these are the things I will do, not just the things that I need to do, but the things I will do. And it will probably be a shorter list that we get from him than the one we put on the altar in front of him. It will probably involve relationships. It will probably involve people who need us. Uh, one of my favorite statements from President Monson when he was a prophet was, there is no problem to be solved that's more important than a person to be loved. And so it's important that we keep this don't don't run faster than we have strength. Don't try to bless everybody in your ward or in your family or in, in, in your neighborhood, but just try a little harder to be a little better at doing what God wants us to do. He'll, he'll give us errands to run, and we'll figure out how to run them. I just want to spend a moment talking about two words that show up in these passages that we've been discussing. The first one's back in verse 16, and it's the word sucker. And if you don't actually see the word, you'd think, oh man, I love suckers. My kids actually, when I'm reading this verse to them, they're like, oh, I love the scriptures. Like, no, it's not that kind of a sucker. It's an interesting word that we don't really use in our common language. And I want to talk about this because this is about the covenants we've all made with each other and to God to sustain one another. So in the church, we are all given opportunities to serve. And there's official callings and unofficial callings, right? We all should be serving one another on a regular basis. But there are official callings, and we get the opportunity to raise our arms to square to sustain one another. And to sustain means, you know, you'll stand underneath and give somebody support. And the word sucker is very similar. It actually means, comes from the word like, like submarine and a course, like you're running a course. It literally means to run underneath somebody. So imagine somebody's out symbolically engaged in some activity, they're moving along, you're running underneath them to support them. And also you yourselves will run underneath and support those that stand in need of you running underneath them to support them. So again, that's sustaining. That's what God has asked us to do. It's one of the covenantal things we've all promised to do when we were baptized, is to support one another. Here's the other word that I think is super beautiful. We talked about verse 20, because we're all beggars, and what do we all ultimately care about? Sure, we all want some food and shelter, but ultimately, we all want our sins removed from us. And the word that is used here, verse 20, and behold, even at this time, you have been calling on his name and begging for a remission of your sins. It's a very interesting word. Remission. You notice that the word remission actually has the word mission in it. We all know what a mission is, right? Somebody is sent out or sent away. Isn't that what we want with our Sins, we just want them sent away. And re actually means again, or it's kind of the intensifier of the word. So like, fully send them away from me. And that is what the atonement does for us. When we beg God in all sincerity and promise, as we've all done at baptism, every week at the sacrament, this is what we're seeking. God, send away my sins. And he will do so. So as you... Ponder, study, discuss 
Mosiah chapter 4, we would invite you, encourage you to look deeply for all of these – there are so many elements in here that he's telling his people to focus on and so many things to add to your your to-do list, your expectation list, but as you move forward individually and collectively as as a family and as a ward, as a stake, to focus on putting all of those things before the Lord and making sure that you're allowing him to be a part of this process of making sense of how you actually apply all these things. So King Benjamin officially, formally ends his speech at the end of chapter 4 and now he wants to know the effect basically in in chapter 5 when it says in verse 1, now it came to pass that when King Benjamin had thus spoken to his people, he sent among them desiring to know of his people if they believed the words which he had spoken unto them. Did did you get it? I I didn't just waste your time, did I? He has a pretty good idea because they were on the ground and they all cried with one voice saying, yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us and also we know of their assurity and truth because because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. Brothers and sisters, we've said it before, I'm going to say it again because I think it's worth repeating. You can change because of things you see and hear, but usually, usually, the most lasting changes that we make as human beings come because we've had something come in mind, eyes, ears, somehow it's come into our mind and then the Holy Ghost carries it deep into the heart. We feel certain truths. So you can, you can get engaged with arguments, with debates, you can, you can discuss all kinds of things out there in the world that the Holy Ghost probably isn't going to be interested in testifying of. But when you are talking about things that really matter, there's a power that comes from the Holy Ghost carrying the message beyond the eyes and the ears and the mind, taking it deep down into the heart and from the heart, then it becomes more likely to get out into the hands and into the feet and into the very soul of who we are. It changes us. The Holy Ghost has the sanctifying power to change us through the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what's happening here. These people are sitting there saying, we we have no more disposition to do evil. Now, turn over to verse 5. We are willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and to be obedient to his commandments in all things that he shall command us all the remainder of our days, that we may not bring upon ourselves a never-ending torment, as has been spoken by the angel, that we may not drink out of the cup of the wrath of God." Now, you'll notice King Benjamin's response. He, He was very, very grateful to hear this. This is what he had desired. And so, look at verse 7. Now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ. Now, we have to pause here and ask a a simple theoretical question. What would you do if on the next fast Sunday you have in in your ward when we're able to to meet together, uh, what would you do if somebody in your ward stood up at the podium and said, brothers and sisters, and they, they share their testimony at the very end, they say, and I am so grateful that we are children of Christ. I'm grateful that he's our Father." And then they finished, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, and sat down. What would most people in a, in a Latter-day Saint congregation say or think or feel? For most, it, it would be a little odd. It would be a little strange. Now, what would happen if that same person said the same thing in most other Christian congregations, said, I am so grateful that we have Jesus Christ as our Father, that we're children of Christ. Most other Christian congregations would say something like, Amen, hallelujah, it's, it's, that's great. Now let's do the opposite. What if somebody stood at the podium and said, I am so grateful for our elder brother, Jesus Christ. 
I'm so grateful that we can be his brothers and sisters. Most people, I think, traditionally in, in our congregations as a church would, would be sitting there feeling warm, fuzzy feelings towards their elder brother, Jesus Christ, and, and that's good and that's fitting and that's appropriate. I, I, I should pause here and say sometimes if we're not careful in the church, when we try to teach a certain doctrine, for some reason we feel like we have to tear down some other doctrine or some other belief or some other practice before we can then teach our doctrine. That's not true. I love a phrase President Hinckley used to use all the time, which is bring all the good that you have and see if we can add to it. That, that's what, what we should try to do more of unless setting up camps where it has to be mutually exclusive doctrines. Here's the question. Is Jesus Christ our elder brother? or is he our father? Now, most people watching this are going to think, uh, Tyler, have you gone crazy? Everybody knows he's our elder brother. What makes a person a father? It's when they beget new life. They, they help to create new life. They engender new life in somebody else. So, in this context, how many fathers do we have? Well, the first father that everybody would think of is we have a heavenly father. He engendered new life in our spirit. In that context, Jesus Christ, from our perspective, from, from doctrine in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we believe, and our message is very simple, and it's not widely accepted in the Christian world because of the Christian creeds, and that's okay, but we simply and, I believe, profoundly and powerfully teach that Jesus Christ is God's Son in the Spirit and his only begotten Son in the flesh. So, in that context, we share uh, heavenly parents with him, so he is our spirit brother. There's no question about that. That is true doctrine. We don't have to throw that away. The problem is the scriptures don't emphasize that particular relationship between us and Christ. So it's not that it's not true just because it doesn't get emphasized, it's just that it doesn't get emphasized. The scriptures are going to emphasize that relationship we have with him whereby we find salvation, where, where we're have, where we have the capacity to, to find eternal life. Now watch. We're all born into heaven in the perfect place with perfect parents, perfect environment, and we are spirit children of our heavenly parents. We want to be more like them, so we're willing to leave heaven, that perfect home, that perfect environment, to come down to a very imperfect place for an opportunity to become more like them, which required a new birth. We had to be born again. So the father, in this context of, of using the word father, the label father, can we all just say dad? Dad becomes the father of our physical body. Here's the reality. People don't usually go home to their dad and, and say, hey, I am so grateful you're my brother. We, we just don't do that. And yet, there's no question that dad is your brother. He was born of the same parents you were up in heaven. He is fully, 100% your brother, but we don't emphasize that role because dad has a much, much, much more important role to play in your life and in your eternal progression. It's as your, your dad, because he engendered a new life in you. In the same context, you get to a certain point where in, in life where you realize, I can't progress any further unless there's a new birth, unless I'm born again. Jesus telling Nicodemus in John 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
Jesus refers to this, this birth process, this rebirth process, a born-again process, not just being a good idea for you to consider, but to be absolutely essential for you to enter into the kingdom of God and to become who we need to become. So we have to have a new birth, a new life, and Jesus becomes the father of that new birth. Uh, King Benjamin told us back in chapter 3, the words of the angel, that Jesus Christ is the father of heaven and earth, the father of all things that were created. He engendered new life in all of, all of the world around us, everything that we see. He gave it life. He also, so you can, you can look at him as the father in a variety of ways, the father of the creation, he becomes the father of our spiritual rebirth, where this day he's spiritually begotten us. And by the way, this isn't just unique to, to Latter-day Saint doctrine. Uh, look at the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We all know who he's talking about in this context. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Brother, oh wait, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You'll notice, brothers and sisters, we're not taking anything away from Jesus' relationship with you as your elder brother. We're just adding to it the fact that that little baby that was born was not born to be your brother. You were already his brother. That little baby was born so that he could become your father because it's only when we become his children that we can find salvation. Look at the rest of uh, verse 7. In fact, let's read it again. Now, because of the covenant which you have made, because you entered into a covenant with Christ, you shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters, for behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For you say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name, therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. I don't know that King Benjamin could make this any clearer, and by the way, if you would like uh, a second witness, you could just write in your margin of your scriptures a beautiful cross-reference, Ether 3.14, because that's where Jesus himself is speaking with the brother of Jared, and he teaches the same doctrine out of his own mouth. So you get King Benjamin teaching it, and now you get Jesus teaching it later on, and you've also got some powerful phrases in Abinadi's speech that we'll be covering later on in the year along the exact same lines. Here's the point. Jesus is more than just your, your heavenly brother. He becomes your father through this spiritual rebirth process, and there will come a day when everyone will be brought out of the grave or, or changed in the twinkling of an eye if they're alive. Everyone will receive a resurrected body and Jesus Christ is going to engender new life in that resurrected body. Is it any wonder why Isaiah wouldn't have any problem at all referring to him as the everlasting Father? And if you get eternal life, it's Jesus who engenders that eternal life into you through the power of his infinite atonement, through the price that he's paid for us. This, this gets real when you, when you stop looking at Jesus as just a picture on the wall or a statue on a shelf or a name on a page, but when you start looking at him as your father. What do fathers do? They, they give their name to children when they're born. When I was born, my dad, Dennis Griffin, he put his name on me. I became a griffin. All of my children when they were born, they became griffins. They took my name upon them. When we're born in the covenant, we take 
our new Father's name upon us as a new creature. We get a new start, a fresh start. Just because a little baby is born, do you look at that baby and think, oh, it's perfect, it's wonderful, it's never going to make a mistake? You don't do that. Neither does he. That's why we have things like the sacrament, that you come back every week. Brothers and sisters, this is week in, week out, as uh, Brad Wilcox once said, and weakness in, weakness out. We're constantly coming to him saying, I've struggled again, and we get to make a new covenant every week at that sacrament table and become more and more and more like our Father whose name we've taken upon us, whose spiritual DNA now is part of us. We have the capacity to grow up to become like our parent. Uh, this, is, this is beautiful doctrine. Now, there's one other aspect here that needs to be talked about. You can't be a father. You can't engender new life alone. So, it's pretty easy to see the role of Heavenly Father engendering new life in our spirits as a, a beautiful manifestation of the nature of God being our Heavenly Parents, a perfect Heavenly Father and a perfect Heavenly Mother creating new life for their children. It's easy to see the role of mom and her essential role in engendering this new life. Where's the, where's the role of the mother in the spiritual rebirth? Don't you love how the scriptures refer to this beautiful covenant marriage in scripture where Christ takes his bride, the church, unto himself in a marriage covenant? And what is the offspring of Christ and the church? It's these children that are born into the covenant, placed on that covenant path. We are royal offspring of, of the best of parents. And even if you struggle with parents here, you have, you have the best of parents. Jesus Christ, as the father figure, he presides, he provides, he protects, and the church, the symbol of our mother in this spiritual rebirth and this growth process, she doesn't just give birth and then forget her children. She gives life, and it begins in this beautiful symbolic sense in a baptismal font, completely surrounded by water, exactly like you began your life here. In in entering into the world, starting a new life, and then your mother takes the role of nurturing, teaching, disciplining, helping, guiding, shaping. This is a process, and if you're struggling in life, welcome to the club. We all are. Life's hard. Everybody has issues. We're all wrestling with things in the natural man and woman inside of us and in this natural fallen world. And I love the fact that King Benjamin is emphasizing this role, that you have, you have the Lord Jesus Christ not just as your, your elder brother figure, but as your father. Now some would say, but Tyler, doesn't that take away getting another father, doesn't that water down our first two relationships with our fathers? I would just say that it's only if we take on this relationship with Christ as our father that the first two relationships become eternal and fruitful and meaningful for the rest of all of eternity. If we refuse this covenant, because we say, I don't want to offend dad and mom, then we're going to lose that relationship with dad and mom. Even if dad and mom don't understand what we're doing, if we'll trust Jesus, if we'll believe in God and do the things that we're, we feel in our heart we need to do, we'll find a way, God will find a way to make an eternal relationship with, uh, with dad, that is more beautiful, more rewarding, more enriching than any, any dad on the earth could ever imagine right now. So, no, you're not giving up anything 
by taking on another father, you're actually enhancing and, and deepening those previous relationships. So we've talked a lot about the covenant path and King Benjamin's speech is actually a reinforcement of the covenant path. In, in a covenant, both parties have duties and obligations and, and God has promised to provide blessing and comfort and strength and, and even salvation to us. And what we promise is, if you keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. So if we keep God's commandments, we have the possibility of prospering as he has promised to offer us. And what's interesting here is that King Benjamin provides very clear instructions about what the commandments are. Back in chapter 3, which was last week's lesson, he talks about who it is we are supposed to be trusting, right? Because this is the God of covenants. And we trust God that he will do what he has said he will do. Chapter 4, we learn that we should believe these things. We should do those things. And then if you look at, uh, in chapter 4, basically verses 9 through 30, is a summary of a bunch of commandments that King Benjamin had revealed to the people that they should live so they could prosper in the land. And we can look at each of these things, maybe make a list of yourself and, f and say, what did King Benjamin reveal as a commandment that I can do better at in my life this week so that I can experience more prospering? And what I really love about King Benjamin's speech is that God does not command in all things. He does not want to give a laundry list, even though I did tell you to write the list. He does not just give a list and do check boxes like, you're just walking your way into the kingdom. Good job. He actually just summarizes in verse 29, he says, and finally, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin. For there are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them meaning just trust God, follow the Spirit, let Him guide you as you seek to live your life, and know that as you seek to love others and love God, He will guide you. You will find a pathway through to be able to treat people as they should be treated and to love God, and what you will find is prospering in the land, which is what He wants to offer us. He's already covenantally committed to do these things. He just needs us to play our end of the bargain. And King Benjamin has laid out many ways we can do this. And in the end, he just summarizes, just be good and love God. We sure love you guys. Thank you for being with us today as we've listened to the closing of King Benjamin's speech and his invitation for all of us to be in a covenantal relationship with our spiritual father, Jesus Christ. We encourage you to take advantage of the fabulous resources available through Book of Mormon Central. Gather those around you that you love, your friends, your family. Engage in the gospel with them. Talk to them about what you're learning and ask them about their testimonies. And take this time to build your families in faith. What a beautiful opportunity for you to see everybody around you as not just your spirit brothers and sisters, but your spiritually reborn brothers and sisters as well. We, we're all in this together. We need each other's help. So we just pray that you'll find greater depth of meaning, purpose, and motivation to move forward as sons and daughters of our heavenly parents as well as sons and daughters of Christ. We sure love you guys. Spread light and goodness, and we'll see you next week.